Hey, what's up? I'm Dr. Matthew Harb, and I asked you guys to ask me some questions, and I'm going to go ahead and answer them for you so you can get some insight into what I think about on a day to day basis. So, with that, let's get started. What do you like on your pizza? The best pizza I've ever had was when I lived in New York. It was from a place called Roberta's, and the pizza wasn't even on the menu. It was called the Bee Sting, and it was actually this spicy honey with spicy pepperonis and cooked in a brick oven. It was absolutely amazing. You can't get that many other places, so I was spoiled when I lived in New York for pizza. But I'll eat anything, meat lovers, pepperoni, even if there's pineapple on the pizza, I'll still eat it. In this picture, what are you operating on, and are you gonna drape the leg at the end? And the answer to that is yes, I'm doing what's called a direct anterior hip replacement operation. I use a special table, it's called the HANA table, and this allows me to position the foot. This is the beginning of the operation, so we're just starting. It's a minimally invasive hip replacement operation. It's one of my favorite surgeries to do, and we will get everything prepped and draped by the end. Do you do patient-specific or custom implants? Yes, all of my implants are custom. So what I do before I do an operation, I actually take x-rays and then I load them up onto a computer and I have computer software where I can actually template your hip and get an idea for what size and what type of custom fit we're gonna get before the operation. So every surgery I do is a patient specific custom implantation. And I get an idea beforehand with the computer templating and then I match that up to what I see intraoperatively. And I also use an x-ray during the operation to make sure everything lines up perfectly. I had a PCL injury and now it has been recovered, but I am still unable to walk properly. So many times, if you have any type of significant ligament injury in the knee, the knee at the time of the injury usually dislocates and then comes back. This can lead to a lot of other things, meaning it can lead to cartilage damage, meniscal tears, and even what we call post-traumatic arthritis. If you're more than a year out, you could get an MRI of your knee to assess the amount of damage and then see if you could maybe benefit from like an injection or if a knee replacement would be the best option. But there are a lot of options in between. Is orthopedics a favorable branch for women as it is men? And the answer to that is, it is mostly a male dominated field. There's only 15% of the field is women. So that's something we're trying to improve. We want diversity. We need more females in orthopedic. When you look at the application cycles, there's not always a lot of women that apply to go into orthopedics, but it's something we're trying to fix and work on and get more women in orthopedics. Then we have committees and societies to help facilitate that. So I think moving forward, the number, in the past, the number used to be a lot lower, but I think moving forward, that number is going to increase as we support women in the field of orthopedics. Why haven't there been significant advances in pain management after total knee replacement? Well, there have. This is why most of the knee replacements are actually switching to outpatient. I do over 70% of my, of my surgeries in the outpatient surgical setting, and this is because pain management techniques have gotten a lot better. One, preoperative education, expectations, uh, combination pain medications that we use, blocks, surgical techniques, less soft tissue dissection. This is all allowing patients to go home sooner because pain is controlled, it's controlled better, there's not as much pain, and patients are up and walking quicker. There definitely has been. Why does my shoulder still dislocate when I lift my arm? And I've had multiple shoulder surgeries. So the shoulder stability is controlled by a couple different things. It's the rotator cuff, it's the deltoid, it's the ball and socket itself, it's the labrum, so all those need to be intact. Some people, if they've had multiple traumas to their shoulder, the, the ligaments and the tissues and everything get very stretched out, so it can still be unstable. There's multiple stabilization procedures to address this, and usually when you do the first surgery, you do the most minimal surgery you can to get stability. If that doesn't work, then you increase um, the amount of tissue transfers or bony transfers to achieve stability in the shoulder. What is my favorite surgery to perform? So I'm a hip and knee specialist. I love doing hip and knee operations. I love doing minimally invasive surgeries, outpatient surgeries. So when a patient has a really good outcome from a joint replacement operation, that is, that is my favorite surgery. I love doing that operation. I love good outcomes after hip and knee replacement surgery. Fracture, which type of fractures do you love to fix? Um, for me, being a hip replacement specialist, I do a lot of femoral neck and hip fractures, so that's a really common uh, surgery for me to perform, but I do take trauma calls, so I can fix any type of orthopedic fracture, uh, ankle fracture, wrist fracture, um, tibia, femur fractures, but I would say I really enjoy doing the 
hip fractures because that's my specialty. I feel like I do a really good job and people can have good outcomes after that, meaning they're up and walking quicker and get their mobility back. So I love that. Did you use PMMA? And if you do, does your head hurt for an entire day after? So I do PMMA for those of you who don't know is basically bone cement. And in patients who don't have good bone, we'll sometimes cement the implants in place. The other type of fixation is what we call press fit, where the bone actually grows into the implant. And we use bone cement a lot as orthopedic surgeons. It doesn't give me a headache, but most of the time when I'm operating, I'm operating in what's called an exhaust suit. If you've seen any of my videos where I look like I'm going to outer space, it's because we have these exhaust suits on. They're very well ventilated, so we don't get all the smells of the bone cement. And usually we're only using about two packets and I use a bone cement called a high viscosity cement, meaning it sets pretty quickly. So I don't get a headache after it. If you had to choose to go into another specialty, what would it be? I couldn't imagine doing anything other than orthopedics. I love what I do in my job on a day-to-day -day basis. It is very enjoyable. I love putting people back together. I really couldn't imagine doing anything else. It is just the absolute dream career for me. What experience will help me get a job as an ortho PA? As a PA, you are with the doctor all the time. So I think personality, having a personality that matches with whichever surgeon you're working with is probably one of the most important things. Will total knees follow a trend towards caliper checked kinematic alignment? So when we do a total knee, there's a couple different ways we can do it. One, you could measure 10 millimeters off the end of the bone and we call that a measured resection technique. And you basically measure your gaps and check it like that. Or kinematic alignment where you're using calipers or different tools to measure the balance. I think the perfect answer is a mix between the two of them. And that's what I do. What do you like about the Hannah table? So the Hannah table is a specialized table that I use. I love it because it helps me to position the patient's hip. It makes it really easy for me to perform my minimally invasive hip replacement surgery. I could do the surgery in about an hour or so and patients are up and walking almost 30 minutes after the operation. So it saves on that part and it also helps prevent needing an extra assistant. This is the number one way that people break their hip. So the most common way that people break their hip is a ground level fall. It's usually if you have weak bones like osteoporosis or osteopenia, and it's usually an older patient, they'll fall directly on the hip, direct blow, it will break the hip either at the femoral neck or intertrochanteric area, and uh, then we have to fix it either with a replacement or a nail. Do bone spurs cause impingement on the ulnar nerve? Is there a fix? So if your ulnar nerve is impinged, whether it's by soft tissues, ligaments, bone spurs, then you could get a nerve conduction study to test it out, see if it's slowed. If it's slowed, you could do a release. So yes, there is treatment. What is knee dysplasia? So dysplasia means that the whatever joint we're talking about didn't form right at birth. So it's not a normal joint. When people have dysplasia in their knee, it makes them more prone to other conditions like early arthritis or damage or sports injuries, and that may require an earlier surgery. How to prevent arthritis after an ACL reconstruction surgery? What can I do? So definitely make sure you have good bone health. You can do that by supplementing with vitamin D and calcium. Make sure you're not overweight. I would do exercises to strengthen everything around the knee. In itself, by having an ACL surgery, you actually improve the kinematics of the knee, which can decrease the risk for future arthritis. So that's many times why we do the ACL reconstruction surgery to prevent further arthritis issues down the line. Thoughts about augmented reality for total joint replacement surgery. So augmented reality is coming into the orthopedic fields. It's basically gonna be these goggles that you wear. It looks at the bone, shows you where to make the bone cut, and the idea is that it can help with precision in orthopedics. Now, we've, there's been a lot of studies on augmented reality and robotics and orthopedics, and there's no clinical significant difference in the outcome quite yet. But hopefully down the line, if robotics can become cheaper, improve cost, improve outcomes, less pins in the, uh, less pins in the bone, less risk of fracture, and uh, a smaller incision, then I think there is a big role for robotics and augmented reality. But at this point, we haven't proven more significant clinical outcomes with robotics or augmented reality. How much should I be able to bend my knees after a bilateral surgery 10 months ago? Bilateral means on both sides. You should be, the functional range of motion for a knee is zero to 90 degrees. So you should have more than that. I will say after I do a replacement, most people get about zero to 120, 125 degrees range of motion. It is variable and it is partially based on your preoperative range of motion, but that's about what you should be able to bend at. How good to be an orthopedic surgeon, either skill or heart? So I think you mean determination and you have to be very determined to get through a grueling five-year orthopedic residency program, a fellowship, and then start to build your practice or go into employment. But 
It's not an easy job. You know, you are physically and mentally challenged every single day. I come home, if I do six joint replacements in a day, I'm, ex I'm exhausted, it's tiring. You know, you are replacing an entire body part on a human. So um, it takes a toll on you mentally and physically. How does smoking affect bone density? So smoking affects the small arteries. So your bones are living. They need a blood supply in order to live. And when those small arteries get, get clogged, then you're at risk for bone death or what we call avascular necrosis. And smoking contributes to that. So smoking is a very common cause of arthritis or early bone death, what we call osteonecrosis. How early is too early for a knee replacement? There isn't an age for a knee replacement that's too early. If you have terrible arthritis and you have difficulty with your activities of daily living, you have pain doing just normal tasks and people wouldn't, then you're a candidate for a knee replacement. There is no age cutoff. And the implants we have now are lasting very long, meaning at 30 years, about 60% of implants are still intact. So having to revise it for wearing out is almost a never. How do I improve my dexterity for holding forceps? Thank you. So there's different ways you can hold forceps. And I would say as you do more and more surgery and you operate more and more, you will adapt to what's most comfortable for you. If you have an injury or you have arthritis in one of your joints in your hand and you're trying to adapt to that, you will find a way that is more comfortable. And so when I suture, I, I hold them because I have really big hands, I hold the needle holder in a different position than most people hold it um, so I can get more leverage and so my hand fits a little bit better on it, but you will adapt to whatever's best for you. There's not one technique that's, that's better for one person. I really wanna appreciate you guys for tuning into this. Um, keep asking questions. I will keep making videos, keep making educational content. I love you guys and keep following the channel.